Mm-hmm. And at 38, 39 at the time, I'm asking myself honestly the question of, is my career over as it pertains to elevating? And what about this story, BMF, um, is special or different? Or what are we telling that's different, right? And, um, I, and initially, I didn't want to do it, quite honestly. Yeah. How they are, how we are in public, our persona is just that. It's a persona, right? It's our image. But it's not who we are behind closed doors. It's right. not who we are when we, when we, when we close the curtain. <laughs> You know, uh, had a, you know, just a, like a rich childhood, basically, you know, grew up, played soccer, played different kinds of sports, um, you know, and, um, and, you know, it was like those old, it was like just like an old school childhood, like, you know, took the bus to school and, uh, you know, all those things that being a, a grown up in the eighties and being a Gen Xer, you know, you kind of, you did, you know, you played out in the street and, you know, play tag and, you know that old school climb trees and all that good stuff. Um, and then, you know, you know, growing up in Oakland, my mother was a, um, a public health nurse and she taught in the public schools. And, you know, up until my uh, ninth grade year, we went to uh, Oakland public schools. And then my mother realized that there was going to be a, um, just sort of just a dearth in, in the, the education system, you know, going into high school. And she sent my brother and I to a uh, all boys Catholic high school, St. Mary's in uh, Berkeley, California. And there I really had an opportunity to sort of develop, you know, went to uh, the school was um, at the time was predominantly black. So it was like sort of 60, 40 black. And, you know, you're, you're there with other brothers of like mind, like background. And we had an opportunity to really flourish and uh, find ourselves. Um, we had both, you know, we had white teachers, we had black teachers, male teachers, female teachers in the whole nine. And um, we're still very close to this day. You know, all the brothers that I graduated and went to high school with. And I felt that, um, you know, that's when I got exposed to, uh, you know, being in choir, uh, doing, doing theater, both straight theater and musicals. And, you know, when you grow up, when you go to a, you know, a small school like that, you sort of have to be a jack of all trades. And so that gave me an opportunity to um, to just sort of develop as a student, but also as a, as a young black man, you know, finding, understanding who I am, where I come from and all of those things and gave me an opportunity to really sort of figure out what I want to do and where, what direction I want to do because I wasn't burdened at the time of dysfunctional high, Oakland public school and, you know, in, you know, books and, you know, teachers and classrooms 40 deep and kids not wanting to study and drugs and guns. I just wasn't, I was fortunate in that respect. So, and I wasn't necessarily the best student, but I was one of those kind of kids and students that really participated, you know, and gave my all. And we were encouraged to constantly participate. So it was about being a well-rounded student, a well-rounded individual, not just in the books or not just on the field, but what kind of extra activities are you a part of? You know, we would do, you know, mission work and go into soup kitchens and all those kind of various things. And so that gave me an opportunity to really find a lot, a lot of uh, a different side of my um, my personality as well. Nice. And I, I don't want to try to age you. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, you... I'm 47, this is my 48th year, so it's all good. Oh, okay. So you were you were pretty much at like the tail end of the the Black Panther movement that was in Oakland when you were going into schools. Yeah, I mean, like all of our parents were. So I, we like to we like to say at the time we lived in the spirit of the Panther. You know yeah. what I mean? Because all of our parents were of that time in the '60s yeah. and '70s and whatnot. You know what I mean? And right. and so you know, my mother went to UC Berkeley in the '70s, and you know, part of the, all those demonstrations demonstrations and everything like that so and i had a lot of friends whose parents were like those radical black fathers and black mothers and you know what i mean like the granola blacks and you know what i mean yeah. so and the in the in the weed smoking <laughs> parents and you know what i mean like so 
we were we, we were raised in that spirit you know what i mean and definitely had that right. ethic of like know your history understand who you are don't be afraid to be black know your blackness and know you know what i mean that you you come from strong stock that kind of thing absolutely absolutely <laughs> absolutely what did what did that do for your your confidence um as a kid going into something that is typically a, a fickle industry um how did that how did that shape you to be prepared for becoming an actor well you know my, my mother you know always said that you know this old saying goes it ain't bragging if you can do it you know and so you, you know i was i was raised sort of with that that ali spirit with that sort of tupac spirit of just like you know you have to the, the the thing was and i and this is how it goes you know you, you can't be afraid to proclaim your presence to 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 let people know that you are present that you have arrived that you are in the building so to speak right and so you got to understand as well being of that that hip-hop generation where you know you sat in a cypher and i wasn't a rapper per se but i understand the logic and the of of the braggadocio rapper of I am the best, right? So you take on that mentality that you can't <laughs> with me. You can't, you ain't better than me. So you grow up of a time where, oh, see, this is part of it, being in the street too, you talking <laughs> you playing the dozens with, with cats. You know what I'm saying? You have to be able to defend yourself with these. You gotta be able to defend yourself with your, with your mouth a little bit. You gotta know how to talk a little shit. And you gotta let you gotta, at every turn you to let people know I ain't the one. You know what I'm saying? And so when you grow up with that, with your with your single mother telling you, don't let nobody take advantage of you, don't let nobody whoop your ass if you don't come, you know, fight back. I don't want to hear no sh you grow up with that. So when you when you leave home, you're instilled with those qualities that say, ain't nobody bad like me. And so when you're going into first going first leaving Oakland, you're going into a predominantly white university. And you know, you grew up with the with the notion you have to be twice as good, twice as better, all of those things. I had to have the confidence that said, ain't nobody bad like me. And so I would proclaim all around school, I'm the best, I'm the baddest. I can't, you know what I mean? As I'm listening to my hip hop, to keep, to deflect the white gaze to deflect the energy that was trying to sort of tear me down, if you will, right? And so I would go around and proclaim in school, in the halls in Boston University, I'm a bad mother. And one of the students, I never forget her name, this sister, this woman, not sister, but this a white girl named Crystal Gandrew said, Russell, why are you always telling us you're the best and you're this and that all the time? I said, because I need to do that to believe it for myself. And if I believe it, you must believe it. And that's and that's what becomes interesting. It's it's a matter of one. You have to eliminate everything that you were bred into believing. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're conditioned to believing one thing, which right. is you have limitations. Yeah. And these are your limitations. These are reasons why. And then, especially if you grow up in a diverse community it's typically pointed out that you're not going to make it as far as these other kids are. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you grow up in that empowerment of being the baby of a Panther parent, mm -hmm. it's different because it's more of a, don't let anyone tell you what you can and can't do. Absolutely. If you want it, you do it. If you don't want to do it, you don't do it. And it's just, it changes trajectory for like an adult going up. Yeah. And, and you know the other thing is you know as you said you had you know you my mother taught me nobody's going to give you anything so you have to work for it right so it wasn't as if i'm going into these endeavors lacking mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so mm -hmm. it's like i can do this like and again we're talking about a subjective industry first and foremost right, right. so you do have to have what i like to call and what was explained to me a usable talent. The, the talent aspect is just is one thing, and that's not necessarily enough. Yeah, it is a usable talent. 
You know what I mean? Just because you can juggle some balls, oh, that's fine. That's a talent. Can I use right. that? What can you do with it? What can I do with it? Right. Right. So what is your usable talent in order to help commerce? Right. So, and so when you're discovering that and you're finding that about yourself and realize that, oh, wow, I have a usable talent that mm -hmm. that can that can be a, a, of use to somebody, society, this the school, this industry, or whatever. Now, how do I cultivate that? Right. You know? and, and that's what going to school was. And then you leave school and, you know, you you go on and and, uh, and create other opportunities for yourself. Nice. And then getting into your, your acting career, um, when you look through your resume, it doesn't it doesn't feel like you were just taking any job. It looks very strategic into the roles that you were playing. Mm -hmm. um, was that was that purposely done by you did you did you fear that turning down certain jobs would be like problematic or a, a holdback for you um yes no not in the beginning it wasn't honestly you know and and see the thing is what i know now that i didn't understand then is how you carry yourself becomes people's perception of you or you know how you start can be how you finish generally and so why do I say that um, I get I get I get out of school. And so at the time, I was always presented older than I was. I always had an older presence. I didn't have the youthful kind of like sexy young thing kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, Tay Diggs or Omar Epps or Mackay Fight. You know, I didn't have I didn't come up with that kind of thing. So I'm doing theater. So you're doing theater. You're doing August Wilson. You're doing Lynn Nottage. You're doing this 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 these plays of gravitas, of gravity, right? So you get out, you're doing August Wilson. So now people's perception of you is different because you didn't, you don't, you don't just come, you're not just coming out. Oh, this is your brother just came out from the street. Let's put him in this. Let's put him in that. He could be the sexy lead. No, no. This is a man of substance. This is a man, a young man of stature. So therefore there's a new, a new wave was happening. They were starting to give brothers more opportunity in young brothers more opportunity in um, uh, shows, television series. Now I'm here. I am playing my first job as the chief president of a, of a hospital, Gideon's Crossing, with Andre Brower. That's because of the present. Now I didn't. That, I didn't go for that. That was just what was there. The opportunity was there. Right. I took it. Got it. And then so then when you come in at that level, that's how people perceive you. You see, gotcha. you, you understand what I'm saying? So yeah. you, I came in at a high level on ABC at a, on a doctor medical drama with Andre Brower, who at the time was an Emmy Award winner, everything like that, been in motion pictures, all of that thing. They go, oh, wow, this Paul Atanasio, Russell Horn. OK, that's the guy. And then so subsequently, all the opportunities were of a different standard. Yeah. You know, and that's so when you can and then so therefore, when you get the opportunity, and you can deliver, here comes another one. Right. And I was fortunate and blessed in that capacity. Yeah, because I I'm a, I love TV. Um, mm -hmm. it, I kind of try to binge watch whatever I can at night when I'm done working. And medical shows to me have the, the hardest job because the dialect is so thick. <laughs> right. And then you have so much like, <laughs> there's so much, there's so much text but it's in medical jargon and then you still have to emit those emotions mm -hmm. and still like keep everything together. So I, I think that anyone that goes into a, a medical based show, mm -hmm. it's a challenge. Absolutely. Uh, for those different reasons. So to do that as like your first job and then say, here I am, it, it definitely does set you on a different standard than someone who just has to portray what they typically are on day to day base. And, and so, but then the question becomes, why is that? It's the preparation, right? So you're talking about four years at the university where I'm learning raised, elevated text. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're talking about the Chekhov, we're talking about the Shakespeare with the ennui and all of those things. And then you go from using that, then the elevated text in the theater of, of the August Wilson, right? Mm -hmm. So then therefore, oh, all of a sudden this 25, 26 year old who can play this chief resident, that jargon isn't as difficult as it would be for the person who's 
not prepared, if you will. Right, right. And then you, I guess, like recently, I, I just seen a whole lot more of you. Um, Lincoln Rhymes was amazing. Right. Um, that it's, I, I, for me, it's hard to understand how someone could become immobile. Mm -hmm. And just like the small details of you can't turn your neck. And then like, what would you do if you can't? Like, I just, I tried for about five minutes and I was like, this wouldn't work for me. Like, <laughs> I, I couldn't be paralyzed. Um, but it's those things, like you, you see these characters and when I when I see you as a character, I never see you as you. I see you as the character, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is challenging because most people you see them as that last role, right? And you're able to not fall into the roles, and even with them being closely resembled, they're not really that close. So you're literally becoming different people. Mm -hmm. Most people don't do that, right? Um, so one commend you for that. It's, it's amazing. Um. When you, when you now see that, it may just happen before for you. When you see that all of these things are happening like back to back mm -hmm. and they're not small things, like these are becoming like bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. How does that feel um, knowing where you started at? Um, <laughs> I think it's twofold. I think first it's a, uh... To be, if I were to be honest, I would say that it's a sense of relief mm. um, because when I got in it and once you, you know, when you when you work with the likes of a, of a Lynn Nottage, when you work with the likes of an August Wilson, when you work opposite Viola Davis, when you work opposite, you know, stage luminaries like a Stephen McKinley Henderson, a Ruben Santiago Hudson, a Keith David and, and many others. Yeah. You begin to say to yourself, uh, I'm amongst the swells. I'm, as the old folks would say, I'm swimming in high cot, right? <laughs> right. And, and so the validation comes where they go, wow, man, this is this young brother, he's got something, mm -hmm. right? And then you you're working. And so you 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 start to sort of differentiate yourself from just working to getting wonderful opportunities to getting career changing opportunities right so up until i get grim i was i was working and you get grim that's a career changing opportunity right then you go and you do you do the play offenses another opportunity and then you go six years of, of grim and you're sitting yourself well working is great but i think i'm do something different i think i'm do something better because i know the talent i have Mm -hmm. And at 38, 39 at the time, I'm asking myself, honestly, the question of, is my career over as it pertains to elevating? Wow. You, I mean, I'm being very serious. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Because you're doing six years of a television show where basically at, after the second or third season, all you have to do is show up. Yeah. You know what I mean? So then, lo and behold, you get a call from Denzel Washington that says, Russell, we're going to put the gang back together again to do Fences, the film, the motion picture. That's where the relief comes. Mm. I'm gonna get a shot. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, yeah. and so once once I shoot that film, that film, my whole life, the trajectory of my career changed. Now I'm all after that, that was the career altering, career defining opportunity that I needed to be able to show the industry, to show the people, I'm more than just a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, if you will, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. That I can, that I am a full actor in a, with a full range of emotion and ability and capacity to give those those different kind of characters that you spoke of, that, yeah. that are, aren't of me, but they're of the character. And, yeah. And so that's what I'm saying. So that's, what the, that's how it feels, it's relief. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's scary because in the public eye, we, when we start seeing the same person, we start comparing the characters and it's like, oh, they always play the same person. Right. And you get stuck in that. And then it's, it's very, it's very weird because you get stuck in that mindset 
of, oh, they're always playing the same person. And then that turns into, they can't really act mm -hmm. because it's, there's no stretch. Right. So to be able to stretch the way that you have has been, I mean, it's been amazing. And now hearing the story behind it and how you, how you feel about it, that even solidifies it a little more. Um, now your new projects, you have, you have BMF, which mm -hmm. is, it's going crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. which I have, I have that, that, that teeter totter feeling about it's like, I, I love aspects of the show. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other side of you is like, so because I love this show, am I glorifying the drug dealer lifestyle? Mm -hmm. And then what I love about it is that there's so much messaging behind the drug dealing lifestyle. It's what about your family? Look at what you're doing to your community. Mm -hmm. Your, your parents worked and play for everything that they have and you're destroying that as well. Now you're putting them at risk. And you had a scene where you said, I built this house and you come in this house and you're tearing down our community. Mm -hmm. And that, like that line stuck with me. I was like, one, you don't really think about it that way. You're just looking at this show, but there's so much structure behind that. Um, what appealed to you about this role um, and do you find yourself having any of those same thoughts? Like, should we be having this conversation about these guys? Um, well, first I, I did have those questions that I had the reservations of does do these, or does, does these, do these stories need to be told again? And what about this story BMF, um, is special or different or what are we telling that's different? Right. And, <laughs> um, and initially, I didn't want to do it, quite honestly. And so I, I um, Tasha Smith, who, who's, who um, directed the pilot, the first two episodes in the in the episode, final episode, is a dear friend of mine. And uh, we go back some 20 years. And, you know, I told her about my reservations about it. And she said to me, Russell, I know that you, this is not just another father role. And I don't want to, we're not going to approach it that way. But in order for us to tell this story the way it needs to be told, we need your presence for people to feel it because we're going to tell this origin story and I'm going to make sure that the origin story has the parents deep in this, in this story, you know, deep in the show. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe there's another actor right now who can give the depth and breadth that you do Yeah. in order for people to really empathize with this family and the parents and, you know, everything of that nature. So when she said that, and I had an opportunity to talk with Randy Huggins, and he felt the same way and was committed to that, you know? And and so there, then I felt, well, you know what? It is incumbent upon me to, you know, lend my talents to this project so that we can shift the messaging, if you mm -hmm. will. And, and then so, and then tell a different side of the story and tell it with a deeper resonance than what people are used to see, you yeah. know? So yeah. it's, it's, it's not just about the story we tell, it's how we tell the story and mm -hmm. who do we charge to tell the story? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I think when you hire certain actors, when you hire certain writers or directors, their presence, their creativity, their talent lends itself to a story being told differently, therefore being uh, absorbed differently by the audience, you know? Right. So, and I think with, um, like my last question, um, you have you have the Don King series coming out. Yes. Um, which again, congrats on that as well. Thank you. Um, we we know some things about him, but we don't know a lot about him. Um, regardless of how we feel about him, he's a pioneer in an industry and he's yes. a legend for what he does. Um, again, I know most actors say the hardest thing to do is a portrayal of someone who's still alive. Mm -hmm. um, was this was this hard for you? Was it more like, were you engaging a lot with him to hear those stories personally? Did you learn a lot more about him than you knew beforehand? I did learn a lot about him that I didn't know. I did not have an opportunity to meet Don King. Okay. Um, I was very nervous, scared, quite honestly, terrified, because it, it's twofold. Um, I didn't have the proper 
time to prepare as as I would have liked. So all I all I can do is lean on my 25 years of experience, you know, my ability as an actor and as an artist to um, embody a, a role and a character, and and also know that Don King is represents people that we know in black in black culture in the black community and, and so and and it's he's in a lot of us yeah aspects of him yeah you know what i mean those certain colors you know what i mean and, and so he just had a special way about him but i also was um but i knew that for me i felt i was the right person for the job because again we always talk about you don't judge a character and he's not you don't look at him as a villain. Mm -hmm. I look at him as a as as a black man who took an opportunity and made good on it. Uh, and so you have to. I have to embrace him. I have to perform him, warts and all. But my main objective, and as I spoke to a, the writers about this, was to find his humanity. Mm. However big or small that may be that resides inside him, there is humanity there. Because th let's let's understand something. Black people, black men, black women, what have you, whether we think of them as good or bad, how we see them isn't fully who they are. How they are, how we are in public, our persona is just that, it's a persona, right? It's our image, but it's not who we are behind closed doors. It's right. not who we are when we when we when we close the curtain so i have for me as an artist as an actor i have to ask myself and i may even have to extrapolate this but who is don king behind the closed doors mm -hmm. who was don king from the 50s and the 60s on the streets of cleveland ohio during that jazz bebop era who ran numbers why did he have to do that? What, the, what were the conditions? And then goes to prison and reads every book he can and literally embraces the notion of going to college. Yeah. yeah. Right? Comes out and realizes there's a different way of going about this. And think about the, old, the whole his added only in America. Well, as a black man, he's saying only in America can a black man do this and get away with it. Right only in America. Right. Now I have I have the the wherewithal and the capacity to take advantage of both black folks and white folks equally. Rob, cheat and steal from both of them, only in America, baby. Yeah. Because see what people don't understand is, yeah, he robbed and cheated black folks, but he did it to white folks too. And 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 not only that, white folks got pissed because they said that motherfucker he did it. He got you know, you know what I mean? But, only, yeah. but the thing is, that's only in America. So what he did is he said, I'm buying in to the American dream. I'm buying into it. You, I mean, if you look at it from that standpoint, he said, what do I, what options or what do I, what resources do I have at my disposal? Mm -hmm. Ah, I got this over here, I got this over there. I know how to think. Okay, I got you, America. I see, I see how y'all roll. Right. I'm gonna join you because I can't beat you. Yeah. I'm gonna join you. And so when I look at it like that, I'm saying there's a humanity, there is a there is an individual in there who had to consciously make a decision as to how he was gonna fight through this mire that we call America life in America. They call being black. And that's what he chose. Now, do I believe, do I think that he didn't go home at night and 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 think to himself what he was doing, how he was going about it? Of course, I believe he did. Mm -hmm. He sat in the dark, sat in the light, whatever, and said, you know what? Tomorrow's a new day, I gotta keep going. It's showtime. Cause it's better me than them. You know what I mean? And it goes back to it goes back to what you said, like nobody's gonna give you anything. Right. So you have to figure it out. You do. And sometimes if people figure it out, they they will do some of the bad to get the good. Um, but ultimately it's, it's trying to live that American dream that is promised. Yeah. With all restrictions in place. 
And, and I think what, which, what's changed which from then to now is that when you look at it, he was really a man on an island. You know, he was an entity unto himself. Now, and again, you know, I, I think he would say, or would have said at that time, he didn't have too many people, black people to really collaborate with or work with. I, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the difference is now we have brothers and sisters that that are make that have made it that are making it that have money where we can go and we can collaborate we can work together we can we have other resources at our disposal where we can make things happen and, and a lot more are possible yeah you know uh now than they were in those you know late 60s early 70s you know into the 80s and so we can do more and we can do better and i think it's our charge to do so you, uh, if I could leave you with one thing, I just wanted just something that just hit me. Yeah. That, uh, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, we, we recently lost Cindy Portier. And, you know, when, when I think about him and you think about, you look at his image and you look at the work that he put forth, what really comes to me when we talk about authenticity and, and we look at culture, and culture is broad, you know, when we talk about our culture. But I think what we really need to start to begin to really fully examine is a, is the standard. Yeah. What is what is the standard? And who are the standard bearers? And what standard? What bar are we trying to raise? And what bar are we trying to reach? Because when we talk about what we're we doing for the culture, culture is, you know what I mean? It's uh, nebulous. It's just it's everything. But what's the standard, you know? And I think for myself, I was introduced to the culture at a young age. I know the culture, I'm of the culture, I'm from the culture. But more importantly, I was introduced to a standard at a young age that said, there is a bar that you must reach and attempt to exceed in order to be successful, not just in this industry, but also for your peers, also for your family and also for your community. There is a standard. And I just wanted to say that because I think that's important. No, I think that's that's very important, especially now when, it, when it's being lowered. Yeah, so I, much. yeah, absolutely. It's, it's being lowered a lot. Um, but that's why we do things to try to change that. Yep. So.